This monarch is Francis I. Crowned in Reims in 1515, he is the emblematic king of the French Renaissance. The great rival of the German Emperor Charles V and a determined builder. One of the residences on which he will set his sights, Fontainebleau. Francis I at one point fell in love with Fontainebleau, that's for sure. The king will come for the pleasure of hunting red and black prey. In other words, wild boars, deer, roe deer. I like particularly the um, quotation overheard from Francis I um, in 1543, where he said, even when I'm in my coffin, I'm going to go hunting. Hunting, always and forever, and also with the proximity of the capital. It being sufficiently far from Paris for you to be able to um, escape the city, uh, but it's sufficiently close um, to be able to be in regular touch with the governing uh, heart of the kingdom. Accustomed to the Chateau d'Amboise, the king likes pomp and splendor. And he also wants to assert his power, so if he has to reside in Fontainebleau, the residence must be worthy of his rank. But with the ruin he inherited on slippery terrain and unstable ground, the task looks perilous. Fortunately, Francis I will be helped by the forest. Its surface area offers an inexhaustible resource of wood for construction, and the nature of its ground provides an abundance of stone, sandstone. So we have, all around the Fontainebleau Basin, where we are now, quarries that have always been used to extract the stone, which is very resistant. The sandstone of Fontainebleau is so exceptional that it was used for the paving stones of the Chateau de Versailles and the entire city of Paris. So Francis I's plan, use the resources at his disposal. But how to build the palace he dreams of on the marshy ground of Fontainebleau? His clever idea, to keep the foundations of the medieval castle located around the oval courtyard. They are the only ones that have stood the test of time, so they are immutable. The king simply had the walled enclosure and the towers knocked down to build new buildings. He also restores the keep that will house his apartments, the keep that is still the heart of the current castle. Passionate about this project, Francis I visualizes everything decides everything, helped only by his construction manager, Gilles Le Breton. At the time, he had no architect. So then how did he achieve this feat? His strength, the deployment of a colossal workforce that will work day and night to satisfy his desires. The first construction campaign that will allow the king, his family and his entourage to settle in the castle of the Oval Courtyard. It takes about two years, but it's a very short period of time. Today, we wouldn't do any better with the technical means we have. A first construction period from 1528 to 1530, which climaxes with this 34-meter-high entrance, the Golden Door. Consisting of several superimposed and richly decorated arches, inspired by his Italian campaigns, it is the castle's first Renaissance structure the one that will open the way to everything else. Unique in its kind, this entrance is designed to impress, and Francis I is not going to stop there. A few years before the king's return to Fontainebleau, the Emperor Charles V humiliated Francis I by holding him captive in Madrid for over a year, and the French sovereign has never forgotten. The captivity of Francis was a t catastrophe, a disaster of the first proportion. Francis I's captivity in Spain marked him forever, but many of the changes in him were good ones in the sense that he had a very clear sense of what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. What would have broken lesser men gave him renewed strength and made him into the remarkable monarch we know. Fontainebleau will be the scene of his revenge. Francis I wanted to restore his reputation and demonstrate his power to his rival, Charles V. It was therefore necessary for him to do new construction. From 1531, the sovereign ordered the creation of a group of imposing buildings on the site of an old abbey bought by the crown. 
Four new wings arranged around a closed rectangular courtyard were built and tripled the surface area of Fontainebleau. It then became the largest castle in France, ahead of Chambord. The work of which Francis I will be most proud, his Renaissance gallery, which now connects the new rectangular courtyard to the former oval courtyard. Never before had someone built such a structure in France. It was the privilege of Rome. Its immense covered walkway, 60 meters long, had to surpass all that existed at the time. It became the largest of all the kingdoms in Europe, the most sumptuous, too. The gallery has a double function, practical, so to get from one place to another or wander around, and symbolic, by demonstrating the richness or culture of the person who has built it. A luxurious and colossal corridor created 1.5 centuries before Versailles' Hall of Mirrors. Francis I kept the key around his neck and reserved it for his distinguished guests. No one should ignore that it's his creation. Throughout, he puts his initial F and his emblem, the salamander, on it. The salamander expresses immortality. It's an animal, a reptile, that is supposed to be able to withstand fire, that is supposed to rise from the flames. For the king, it is to symbolize his durability, his permanence, his immortality. To decorate his gallery in his castle, Francis I stopped at nothing. He brought the greatest artists of the time from Italy. Patronage was his way of asserting his supremacy. Fontainebleau was then likened to a new Rome. The King of France is the most powerful, richest and generous sovereign with artists throughout Europe. The France of the time is New York, in a way. Francis I enjoyed such popularity among artists that Leonardo da Vinci himself bequeathed him his precious Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa, which adorned the walls of the private apartments of the monarchs in Fontainebleau until 1666. Beyond the arts in stone, Francis I is always thinking bigger. He wants to reshape the land to control the hostile nature that surrounds him. But just how to tame marshy, wild lands crossed by a stream? The sovereign is stubborn. He finally found a solution. By diverting and draining the stagnant water into a network of small, tight canals, he was able to create a large eight-hectare Renaissance garden and design an even set of 12 rectangular islets. At the cost of methodical work, Francis I's workers succeeded in taming the water, which was previously only a hostile force. A piece of land that is at first sight poor will turn out to be something quite exceptional and very interesting to develop. Satisfied with his achievements, in 1539, Francis I considered that the time had come to invite his great rival to Fontainebleau, Charles V, an opponent with whom he had been contending for too long. The German emperor has to cross France to reach Flanders, where there is an insurrectional climate, but he doesn't want to linger in Fontainebleau. Francois I thinks otherwise. He wants to dazzle him, impress him. Francis I, with perhaps a little strategy in his mind, um, he organized a whole sequence of huge festivities. A demonstration of power that Charles V is forced to attend. In turn, he was at the mercy of his enemy. Francis I gloats. Thanks to his Renaissance castle, which he will develop until his death in 1547, he is able to snuff out his rival and assert his omnipotence to the world. His successes will never stop preserving his legacy.